Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Yingling, and Jay and I will present uh, this presentation to you. Uh, our other team members are uh, Sheng, Yifan, and Jamak. And uh, we all worked on this uh, very intensely, so just wanted to give them credit. So um, we'll present to you this uh, mega project um, with a healthcare um, theme. Uh, We'll start off with uh, kind of traditionally a little bit of background on, on this mega project, uh, the lessons learned, and uh, a brief conclusion. So uh, for those of you who might not have heard or know details specifically about this project, it's emerging of five um, existing hospitals in Montreal, the uh, Neurological Institute, the Chest Institute, the uh, Montreal General, the Royal Victoria, and the uh, Montreal Children's Hospital. Uh, three of these sites are permanently closed, and two of these sites remain open as point of care services in the downtown core. In addition, the Cedars Cancer Institute was built onto this site, as well, the, as well as the Shriners Hospital for Children. So schematically, these are boxes, but they actually are quite beautiful buildings, and the site is actually very, very large. It's on the former uh, Glen Railroad site, and uh, it has been recently completed. So the timeline and cost, uh, it's a very long, uh, long project to get to this point. Um, it started originally as an idea in 1992, and in 1997, it became an official project. Uh, the site was secured. Uh, funding changed from purely public to a mix of public and private, um, as something called P3, and we'll elaborate on that later. Uh, the end of the construction was 2014, and commissioning and handover was in 2015. Uh, the final opening was in June of 14 of this year. So it cost $3.6 billion, but the original cost was $1.3 billion. It required 7 million uh, man hours, and it's a 3 million square foot facility. So the purpose of such a project is to uh, integrate the healthcare services in, in Montreal. Uh, they don't have something like the Universal Health Network, which is a hospital alley. Um, these are um, the major hospitals in one location in Toronto. So they needed to um, merge it in onto one site to efficiently utilize resources and reduce unnecessary competition. Uh, a big aspect of this project was the way it was funded, and this created some instability in the project, um, which we'll discuss later. P3 is used in construction and energy sectors, and in the UK it's been used for over 15 years. Uh, stakeholders are pretty much everybody, um, the Quebec public, the Canadian public, patients and staff in healthcare, uh, medical research groups, the McGill University, and uh, neighboring residents. Many more may, may uh, um, exist. So in terms of the lessons learned, we'll present to you positive and negative lessons learned. It was such a long project, 23 years, um, that some positive uh, lessons learned were actually implemented during the project. And negative lessons learned are those that we think should be um, captured and then used for other similar future projects. So uh, the first lesson learned is regarding uh, sponsorship change, especially specifically the finance. And um, changing from purely public to uh, public-private created a lot of instability. And um, this was based on discount rates that were sometimes not very conservative um, and assumptions that are more optimistic than pessimistic. The Auditor General of Quebec had um, commented that there was a lack of rigorous value-added analysis. And um, because it became a P3, um, the cost estimation uh, became much less um, transparent. Um, and so the lesson learned uh, for this first theme is to develop firm sponsorship methodologies early on. The second lesson learned is regarding cost and budget control. Um, and this, again, has to do with the P3 structure. Uh, because of the scope changes, uh, this became a very, a much maybe more complex project. Um, there's lack of budget approvals and updates. Sometimes these updates were one to two years behind the actual um, observation of that um, error in the development. Uh, so there's a need to monitor costs by the government and the public. And um, an analysis by IRIS, uh, a third party group, uh, suggests that um, this project should actually be bought back by the government from the uh, P3 conglomerate. 
It's a little bit like uh, leasing a car and buying a car or uh, a mortgage on a house. Uh, due to the interest rate, um, in the past we could pay double the actual capital cost of the house over the long term. But there's an inherent conflict of interest because the private um, part of the P3 seeks to gain more and more profit, whereas the public part seeks to deliver a healthcare service to the public. So in that case, um, budget control is quite challenging. Uh, so that lesson learned is to incorporate these changes to better monitor costs and, and budget. The third lesson learned is regarding um, using standards that are uh, known to the public, identifiable, and consistent. And in, as an example, it's LEED certification. Um, LEED certification has four levels of uh, quality, let's say, and its aim is to improve operating efficiency and drive innovation. And because it's a brand name, it's, it could be also trusted um, more easily by stakeholders. Um, so the third lesson learned is to use these kind of standard criteria to drive innovation, um, increase uh, stakeholder trust, and, uh, and overall um, make the project run smoothly. So the fourth lesson learned is regarding something like human factors um, in design. And this is a new concept. Uh, so functional mock-ups, uh, rooms that uh, were life scale, were uh, tested for uh, ergonomics, iteratively refined in, in terms of the design and layout of the room before full-scale implementation. And this is a, a new concept, and this is a, what we think is a change-driven process. Um, and this is to overall, in the, in the long run, save on cost. So the fifth lesson learned is regarding uh, medical equipment procurement. This is a very complex project, and uh, procurement of medical devices uh, is a big part of the budget, um, both not just the capital initial buying of the uh, medical devices, but also the maintenance of those medical devices. And officially, they, they have stated that um, the investment for medical devices is about $255 million. Looking at their tendering system, uh, we found that um, among the notices for, for tendering, they were looking at very advanced equipment that are supposedly irreplaceable. The irreplaceable part of that justifies a high cost, but actually um, we need hospital-based health technology assessment to identify medical devices that are replaceable. The replaceability of that means that there will be um, much more open competition to tender. And other jurisdictions like Italy and Czech Republic have implemented hospital-based HTA to decrease corruption and improve decision-making in uh, medical equipment procurement. So the lesson learned in this case is to expand that competitive process um, using tools that other uh, countries have used, and this is hospital-based health technology assessment. Uh, the sixth lesson learned is a positive lesson learned. It's regarding the project management office and because it's a transition and merging of five hospitals to one, it's actually appropriately renamed Transition Support Office. So this is um, directed by uh, Marie-Claire Richer, and she is a leader with a PhD in nursing and assumably a lot of experience in frontline care and uh, strong project management skills. She's a chair of uh, project management at the University of Montreal. So just to take a, a diagram that's not ours, uh, she has a good mix of leadership because of her experience as well as knowledge of project management processes. And this made it, um, uh, she made it, uh, she led a team that was able to look at a new approach to healthcare um, projects. Um, and healthcare is special because um, it, there are many types of themes like practice-based approaches, people-based approaches and process-based approaches. So she developed typologies, which she published on. And these typologies can be used um, to approach complex projects um, as a mix, as a combination of these. And um, it is hoped that uh, this, cha this promoted change management, process review, evidence-based decision-making again, and knowledge transfer for future healthcare projects. Um, so the positive lesson learned is to aim to uh, develop appropriate approaches to increase the likelihood of success. And I'll hand it over to Jay. Hello. Hello. Um, so moving on to the next lesson. Um, so this is, the lesson we learned from merging hospitals is, well, 
before the merger began, these, had, these hospitals, there are five hospitals being merged, and they had a long-standing rivalry. Now, something they learned to do along, along, along the process was, was that they should never lose sight of the big picture, and the way that they merged these five rival hospitals is by identifying collective common interests. Through this, they achieved uh, an enhanced referral system when you go to a doctor and you're referred to another doctor, and the other doctor is from the same super hospital, it's a much smoother process. And they have a smoother interface with the insurance companies. And you know, overall, they, had, they, predict, they were able to provide a better healthcare delivery. So by strategically managing the merger, it, it's closer to a success uh, than a negative merger. Uh, moving on to the next lesson, this is lesson eight. So here, what happened was our former CEO Arthur Porter, he, he purchased some land and he struck a deal with this land and this land was uh, designated to be the out, outpatient ward and what happened was for some reasons that I'll discuss later, he had to be fired and once he got fired, they lo the, the rest of the board of directors could not uh, manage the deal that, they, that he struck with for this land and they lost the land. The construction has already begun, but they had to, it had to be demolished and which created a $115 million deficit. That meant layovers. So 277 people lost their jobs and simply a bad handover. And so the lesson here is we should always have a clear, transparent and regular communication channel with all the stakeholders, and this is vital for any project. Um, moving on, there's been uh, a lot of uh, corruption uh, regarding this case, and it's been in the media of late. Uh, the it, Charbonneau Commission, that is uh, Honorable Lady Charbonneau giving you the look. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Charbonneau Commission is a commission set up in Quebec uh, dedicated to investigating public construction contracts. And uh, this is, they have had a lot of success. The commission has lot, had, had a lot of success before they started investigating MUHC, but uh, they found that there has been a lot of corruption and uh, for investigation has found that there has been frauds and fraud, there has been fraud and forgery on uh, MUHC and SNC side. SNC Lavalin was the company that was doing the construction for the site. And uh, the prime suspect was Dr. Arthur Porter, the former CEO. And through further investigation, uh, if you've been following the news in the last couple of months, you should have known by this, they found that Porter received a bribe of $22.5 million. And with this bribe, because he got the bribe from SNC, he awarded the contract to SNC and not rivaling companies. Uh, so when we were looking at when we were looking at this, these, we were looking the we were doing the background check. We figured the, in media it was being shown that Porter had contacts with arms dealers and uh, he, he had a shell company. And so we were thinking, why why would someone put a man like that in in that higher position? But if you look at his resume, it's a very impressive resume. He was um, in the U.S. He was a professor and chairman before coming to Canada and in. On in Ontario, he became, quickly became the chairman for Victoria Hospital, and um, uh, he became the privy counselor to Stephen Harper, and then he was also selected as the chair of Security Intelligence Review Committee. So he was, he was sending ops to other countries, and he was overviewing all this Canadian intelligence activity. So he was the last guy who anyone ever suspected, and in, after the, the corruption scandal has come out, the investigation has found that he founded a shell company and he put the bribe that he received from SNC in through the shell company and uh, in 2010, his connections with arms dealers and international lobbyists, US Air Force aircrafts, they were able to smuggle. So they were really strong armed dealers. And um, so one lesson from this is we monitor closely our stakeholders and we should always have an eye out for corruption. Uh, stakeholders should be thought of as assets as well and we should, we should always keep an eye on them. So the last lesson here is we should provide an incentive for whistleblowers. In the US there are a lot of incentives for whistleblowers and 
uh, if one random week you pick out of 2013, it's, you find about $250,000 being, uh, $250,000 checks written out for whistleblowing, whistleblowers. In Canada, there is no such thing. If you blow a whistle on your boss, it's very likely that you lose your job. So, <laughs> you agree? <laughs> so they're setting up uh, hotlines, or whistleblowing hotlines, but as of now, since there are no incentives, uh, we have some uh, surveys here. Eight called in 2014 for whistleblowers in Can Canadian security agencies, 3,200 in 2013. Um, we're working on it, and uh, a lesson here is amend the policies in a way that we'll have more incentives for for whistleblowers. That was the last lesson, and as a concluding remark, I I want to say this is this is one of the biggest projects uh, in Canada, and it's one of the biggest corruption scandals too. Uh, having said that, there there's a lot of lessons that have been learned, and I believe while the project has been completed in mid June this year, there are still lessons to be learned as with, with time as the project keeps running on at, with execution. Um, so that was our presentation. We, we acknowledge Dr. Uh, Professor Keith Farndale and uh, Min Nguyen and uh, William for speaking to us uh, and having, our, we had interviews with, well, we also had interviews some, with some of the nurses who worked under Dr. Porter directly. So thanks you, thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks for your time, Good, everybody. So for obvious reasons, we use the lessons learned from this current project, and uh, what we would do is, ha like the last few lessons I have spoken about to, to remove corruption, and because the corruption value, the value that went into scandals is huge, and it, it came out of our pockets, right? So, um, what would you do as a project manager? Like as a PMO, like, you know, those types of things are more policy, you know, you'd have right. to kind of, those would take a while, but what, were, what would be some concrete things you would do to lead the project differently? I don't have an answer off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, by the end of the quick Q&A session, I'll come up with a good answer. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is very real. That's a good answer in itself. <laughs> okay, Paul. Yes, well, I, uh, again, congratulate uh, you on this uh, presentation. <laughs> and it's certainly, you know, when I see projects like this, they're just mega, mega projects. And uh, we could probably spend uh, the weekend talking about lessons learned here. Uh, but I am fascinated about the merger. So you're bringing together um, um, different uh, institutions, and to me, you know, you look at that. There's going to be redundancies in a lot of areas, uh, a lot of a lot of key positions. What uh, do you think um, politics play into into uh, projects like this, and, and how could that be um, diverted? Okay, that's a very good question because this is one of the lessons learned uh, for this project. Um, as Jay explained, these merging hospitals had very traditional competition between itself. So they came up with this policy to focus on the community interests, the public interest, in, uh, instead of the individuals. Uh, they had initially they had problems with committee management, with the board of um, seniors, and these type of uh, 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 councils. But uh, they decided to change the focus and more focus on the community interests in order to uh, serve better and uh, gain the, and reach uh, approach the goals of the merging hospitals. So. Okay. Um, right down the street, or up the street from where we are, there's the University Out Network, which is associated with this university, uh, and also with um, a bunch of different uh, kind of uh, innovative kind of um, groups. So did you do a little bit of research to see which model was, because the model here is different. They chose on purpose to leave the, the different institutions like with their own kind of buildings, their own kind of practices, but then they merge in terms of 
logistics and procurement and uh, being more kind of educational and that kind of stuff. While these guys decided to literally get rid of some stuff and physically merge everything more dif mm -hmm. like differently. So did you kind of look at the two? Yeah. Um, initially, we tried to find um, other models that, um, healthcare models, mm -hmm. that lessons learned may have been modeled from. Um, we, there's a, there was a huge project management office, the TSO, that was previously mentioned. Um, but it seemed like um, politics played a big role. And um, this decision m made a long time ago was difficult for us to research. Um, in 1992, that kind of information was not available. Um, specifically, uh, like, uh, I'm based at Sick Kids. I'm a, graduate student, and I know that they follow an ISO process to manage projects, um, but unfortunately we, we didn't have that kind of access to um, the McGill project. Um, they did, uh, they did, they were more um, proactive and pers pers prospective um, as how they um, developed the approaches to tackling the sub-projects of the main project. Um, yeah. Uh, there was just not enough information, um, but I think uh, they tried to incorporate project management uh, processes in their own way, and that's how we tackled it. Yes, thanks for your presentation. Um, your first lesson learned that you identified was that the sponsorship, sponsorship project sponsorship changed from public to P3, and the lesson learned was to develop a firm sponsorship early on. Mm -hmm. So. Does that mean that, um, that that should never change? Uh, like you can't basically uh, change the sponsorship model once the project is initiated, or uh, or what? Because it seemed that there were probably compelling reasons for them to change that. Um, good question. Thank you. I think um, what we meant was uh, um, it, it is better to look thoroughly at all the process and all the parameters involved in determining how, uh, uh, how a sponsor should be selected uh, at the very beginning of the project, especially in terms of like uh, determining a very uh, rigid and very structured and scientific-based uh, method of determining which method would be better. Um, so in terms of, uh, in, in this case, uh, the P3 method was um, selected after many years of uh, many years into the project, which brings a lot of confusion and a lot of um, uh, practices that was not done before in Canada. And people managing these kind of a mega projects didn't have the experience and have, uh, have all the good practice in place, project man management practice in place. So that lead to a lot of um, uh, cost overshot and uh, you know, budget control issues. So what we meant was really to establish a firm methodology for establishing, uh, for, for determining which method to use so that they can have a good reference point from, from very beginning uh, to, to avoid future confusions when they're switching to different methods. Good. Lady at the back. Um, this is now, I understand, it's a question from a competing team. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, so initially, we um, we stated uh, why the the purpose of um, of the the merger um, the yeah, also the infrastructure in Montreal. These buildings are hundreds of years old, and it costs a lot to retrofit and remove types of insulation that are now dangerous. So it costs more to re um, renovate those those buildings. So I, I think that's why they also decided to start from the ground up. Um, and there's also competing and there's redundancies, as mentioned before, in, in the healthcare system. Um, so that's the reason. Good, right here. Staying on that point, uh, these are publicly delivered services, so there's always a very strong political component to these decisions. Was there any evidence of good stakeholder analysis? And I think in particular, you've got 
the medical professionals, so the doctors and the nurses, they have unions. You have the, the various hospital trades that are also unionized. You have local communities. Was there any evidence of good stakeholder analysis leading to this decision to consolidate these uh, five sites? Uh, leading to it, we're, we're not sure. Um, there, there were issues with human resources, and during the transition, there was a protest by physicians, phys physician-led protests, um, probably some union groups too. Um, it was very hard to dig up that kind of information because it, because it was the P3, a lot of the documents were closed to us or in French, and um, the analysis is just, you know, that much more difficult. <laughs> No, I think they're still open. I, I don't know. Um, the handover was this year. Um, oh, so, so. Yeah, so they were. But I, I, I don't believe they'll be demolished. I believe they'd be bought by other organizations. So or those buildings still, still exist? They stand erect. They stand erect, but uh, they're mm -hmm. vacant. Oh. <coughs> yeah. We have another question from one of our judges. Uh, so, so June 2015, oh sorry, uh, June 2015 was when the last hospital was merged into the Glen Center. The one hospital merged uh, um, May 26th, April 24th, these are the dates. When, so this is very recent and uh, it's, they haven't been demolished yet as, as, as far as I know. And if it's okay to answer your initial question. I was uh, standing there thinking, um, so if I would look at the biggest uh, lesson learned, and I would, I would, I'm tempted to believe that if we did, if we redid this whole thing, we would start off as a PPP, a P3 project. What happened here was we started as a public. This this entire project was a public sector project, but as you all know, project keeps progressing. You find that you need more funds, and then you try to look for either more sponsors or you, you adapt. So that adapt that this as an adapting technique, we went in from public to uh, public and private. We would have started off as P3 if we read it the whole thing. The reason why we didn't do that from the beginning this time was because we don't have many P3 projects in Canada. We have had a lot of we know uh, that there are a lot of P3 projects happening in the UK and other parts of Europe, but we have had a very negative feedback from the other P3 projects and. So, that, which is why we were initially hesitant, but as the uh, as the cost started increasing, actual started increasing, and we figured that we don't meet the budget lines, uh, we went into P3. We should have started off as P3. Uh, that that's what we will have redone. If we redid it, that's what we would do different. Is that's it great. And what you've just shown is very real in the workforce, where you don't always know all the answers, and you have to go back and get them and come back right. and pull through, just like how you did. So great job. Ah, thank you. <laughs> I have a question. I was just, uh, to me, it, it was a little unclear on the TSO from the support office if this was uh, transitioning into support or if this was uh, really how the project was structured from the beginning. So uh, just a question around project structure because, again, this is a mega project with multiple parties, and I just wanted to find out if, if uh, you were clear on the overall structure and if... Um, you would recommend any changes on that uh, project structure and governance? <laughs> so, so I was very interested in the policy part and uh, I researched the TSO part. Um, it seemed to me like it wasn't from the start because um, the articles that were written by uh, Professor Richet was actually um, fairly recent um, observations of why they were developing these approaches. So. Uh, and the transition support office was um, called transition because of the merging. It wasn't um, transition of the, the project, transition of these um, organizations. So um, that, that was the reason for the, the labeling of TSO. Um, but it seemed to me from the article, the, the research papers that she wrote, it was more um, at, during. It was a very long project, 1992 to 2015. So 23 years of ha had passed. So I, I don't even, if 1983 was when Project Management Institute started here, <laughs> then I think uh, 10 years later, maybe they weren't ad adopting these, these processes from the start in 1992. But I'm just 
inferring. Okay, we're officially out of time. However, there was somebody up there who's been waiting very patiently. There was a hand up at the back. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, um, I understand that your business case was to improve efficiency overall with all these hospitals. And I was just wondering, um, do you have any numbers that support the, the traffic benefit of this project? Because the cost of 3.4 billion to run it, right? So what are the justifications? Do you have any specific numbers for that? Originally it was 1.3. <laughs> so, the final one, the most conservative, is 3.6 billion. Yeah. Um, if, so. if, if you're looking for, say, running costs, execution costs, you'll have to wait for another year. It's, oh, okay. yeah, it's, uh, it's only been, what, three months? Three months since they've been running together. Um, I don't. I don't think we have a specific numbers that's uh, actually posted by uh, by the officials or by the hospital itself. But um, there are discussions about like buying back of the hospital from the uh, P3 conglomerate, um, and I think uh, to some extent they made some uh, calculations and saying that P3 in the long term will not be benefiting to the public. Uh, like over the span of the whole contract, which is 30 years, I think. So um, that may put some light on the, on the indication of how this project might be benefiting. But uh, for now, I think it will stay as P3 because some of the uh, hidden contract clauses in the P3 contract might, might not be like showing whether it is really beneficial for the public to buy it back by the government. Please bear in mind that these, these documents are not available to the public after it became P3. We, it's, it's, yeah, it's, uh, the, the fact that we don't have this information means normal people can't get access to this information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I'm glad you're normal people. <laughs>